Welcome, welcome to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. I am your host, Dr. Michael Lennox. We are coming at you for May 30th, the very end of the most difficult month of the year. And we, in fact, start this episode out with the fact that it is the new moon in Gemini on Monday, May 30th. So we really are at an Alpha Omega moment if you're tuning into the podcast at the very top of the week. I, for one, am very glad to see May slipping into our rearview mirror, which it'll do in a couple of days. I, I'm assuming you probably feel the same way, Zoe. I'm so ready, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it was a brutal month. Yeah. And I want to be very clear. It is changing at this new moon, the dynamic of really everything energetically. But I always get a little nervous when I say that, that people assume that that means like magically all your challenges are going to go away just because we're out of eclipse season and starting a new uh, lunar cycle. And of course, the astrology is going to meet us all right where we are. But truly, the most difficult, challenging energies of the, of the, of the month we're coming out of sort of end today. But before we dive in, in the spirit of Gemini energy and lots of words to say... <laughs> Isn't it a super busy week yeah, for you? Yeah, there's some things to talk about uh, announcement-wise. So let me just go through a couple of little things. Absolutely. First and foremost, it's about to be June, which means this Thursday is the first Thursday in June. So I do my global healing meditation Thursday night, 7 p.m. in my Zoom space. I gather people together. I talk about the astrology for the month in a, in a fun teaching format, and then we uh, meditate together. It's an hour. It's free. And uh, if you want to join me this Thursday and you never have, you can find the link to join me at michaellennox.com by scrolling down to the blog articles. One of those blog articles is devoted to the Global Healing Meditation and the Zoom link is in there. But truly, if you're listening to this podcast and you're not on my mailing list, you need to go to michaellennox.com, sign up for the mailing list so that you get all of these announcements. I'd recommend that because you get the news first. You don't yes, have to wait right. until the podcast comes yeah, right. out. You don't have to wait or hunt for the link. Exactly. We've also got a brand new class launching. Uh, starts June 11th. This is part of my Going Deeper series where we do self-actualization and healing and examining of you know childhood traumas and looking at what's ready to be released at this time. But we use the lens of fairy tales and myths to have that reflection of psyche at this time. Did this last year. I loved it so much. And people responded that I decided to create more of these. And this one is going to use Little Red Riding Hood and Perseus and Medusa tale. Well, we're going to flip the Medusa tale and really come at it from her perspective and her origin story. Check out michaelennox.com under classes for more information about going deeper. But, of course, the thing I really need to let you all know in is my voice story, because <laughs> it's <laughs> come to a completion. And I love that I get to say the month of May and the crazy lunar cycle played out in my life with the story that I, I've been telling you guys each week. Wait, so you're one visit to that specialist did work. I felt like it was a myth. And so we have proof well, here. Well, listen, I had one of these funny things where a literal ENT, a medical doctor said she thought it could be relieved in one session. I was like, all right, well, the doctor's saying that. And then a friend, Colette Baron reed who had this happen to her 25 years ago, said one session would do it. And lo and behold, half an hour of checking in with her, learning about who I am, how I use my voice, and doing some testing of various, you know, breathing techniques. And she was very impressed with my breath control. 
And then a half hour was on her massage table where she put her fingers into my, you know, larynx area and did things with her fingers very lightly and deftly to the musculature of my larynx. It was, in fact, a very obvious problem. My hyoid bone, which is that little wishbone that sits on top of the larynx, got knocked out of alignment. In fact, the left side of the hyoid bone was higher than the right. And that twisted placement got stuck there. And that was what was causing the outrageous vocal fatigue. So at the end of four hours of like session work, I just couldn't speak anymore. I'm going back next week for a follow up just in case. But my voice has come back fully from that one visit. And um, thank God. And so really, if you fall like this started with the new moon in Pisces on my Chiron and essentially ended right after the full moon in Taurus that was an eclipse. And here we are Mm. coming into a new moon that hits today in Gemini, where we get to share our voice or ideas that we express with our voice. And I'm happy to report that all is well in this crazy story that I've been through confronting the difficulties of what, what would I do if my superpower, you know, was, you know, went away. So let's talk about this new moon in Gemini. Gemini Mansion is all about our ideas and communication and thoughts and the sharing of ideas. This is where curiosity first sort of rose up into the human condition. So it's a new moon where we set intentions in the direction of ideas that are lifting us up and things we want to explore and share with others. I think one of the values of a new moon in Gemini, which is intellectually oriented, is we've been through so much deeply emotional changes. And Venus has been so active this year, rewiring our heart centers that I've given a little bit less, you know, sort of airtime to our mental experience that's transforming. Hmm. So... Gemini is where we talk, but one of the challenges of being in a body is too much talk, too much thought, too much thinking. Mm -hmm. So there's something interesting that Mercury is doing right now in a new moon that is ruled by Mercury. Mercury rules Gemini. This is his new moon. He is still retrograde. And he started this retrograde in Gemini, in this mental idea-sharing mansion. But he has backtracked into Taurus. In fact, at this moment of the new moon, he's done what's called stationed in Taurus. He's at 26 degrees there. He's backward facing. But he ain't moving anymore until he turns around to June 2nd and 3rd. So he's sitting in Taurus absolutely still while we, in our conscious awareness, sun, and our dabbling with our unconscious impulses, moon, are in this intention-setting moment in the direction of what are the ideas that are lighting us up at this time. But Taurus is less about talking and more about listening. That's the value of this Mercury retrograde cycle. So if Mercury's off in Gemini, chatting, 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 he might have said something like this to himself. Geez, I'm so confused with all of this talking and overthinking. I better go back to Taurus where I learned how to listen. And this is what the retrograde is giving us, an opportunity to move away from too much chatter, too much thinking, too much monkey mind, and into a more grounded, loving, heartfelt, listening space. So what a beautiful opportunity to set intentions that are about the thoughts we have and the ideas we want to share, but to also ground those intentions into a deep stillness space so that we're moving about the world sharply connected to our thoughts, ideas, and intellect, but not 
overly identified with what we're thinking. Like I'm reminded of the trope, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> I don't know if I've heard that one, but I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of my favorites when I learned it first decades ago. I can't remember the first place I heard it, but really, don't believe everything you think, kids. And this is a new moon and a mansion where we want to be in that consideration, in the Gemini mansion. We want to be in alignment with right thinking. And one of the ways we do that is to slow down our response pace so that we can understand what our hearts want and what we are in the listening for. Why this might be a little difficult in this particular week and the kicking off of the month of June with this new moon is on the side of the new moon in Gemini is Mars and Jupiter in conjunction. That's the planet of action and the planet of abundance, prosperity, and manifestation gathering in the cardinal startup, powerful beginning sensation of Aries. That energy alone has us wanting to be in action in a ridiculously powerful way. Someone literally yesterday was like, hey, it's in Aries. Time to go. Get your shit done. <laughs> <laughs> Which is accurate. And there's energetic support for that idea. And the geometrical relationship between Aries and Gemini is a 60 degree angle. They work well together. Mm -hmm. You've got the fire element from Aries, Mars and Jupiter in Aries, and the air element from sun and moon in Gemini and put them together. And it's like we're making a sort of a butane sort of controlled flame sense of readiness to move forward, courtesy of Mars, and a sense of intellectual curiosity from the new moon. But Mercury is retrograde and Saturn, the delay bringer, is squaring the nodes of the moon still. Mm -hmm. Mercury in his retrograde says the desires you have now may be delayed a bit. And then Saturn squaring the nodes of the moon all year make 2022 a year where it's more challenging to process the past and move into new territory because there are lessons we might have to learn along the way, right? So we are, in fact, ready to bang out the gate in a huge startup fiery energy right now. And we've got the intellectual orientation to get our minds in alignment with those desires. And there's still some delay built into the system. Set your intentions with thoughts and sharing of those thoughts, but put your soul's focus on what are you in the listening for so that we can continue to line up our hearts and our minds so that they are in congruency. So that what we're thinking is also what we're feeling into. What we feel that we deserve is what our minds are aligning us up to create with powerful intentions we set at this time. We still have the third act of Mercury's retrograde cycle to get through. This is the week he turns around and goes direct. So at the very end of the day on June 2nd slash June 3rd, for points, you know, east, that's when he turns around. So as Thursday is becoming Friday of this week, Mercury goes direct. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we still have to get through the two and a half weeks of his wrap up, this what's known as uh, the direct shadow. He's now moving direct. But between June 3rd, and June 18th, he's going to be revisiting all the territory he hit over the last sort of six weeks, the three weeks of the first part, and then the three weeks of backward motion. Mm -hmm. So you can expect the month to include issues to return that might have come up in late April and mid-May, but we will certainly be a little bit more comfortable once we get into Friday and Mercury is direct once again. The month itself of June will be more gentle energetically 
because eclipses are behind us, because Mercury in his direct shadow is still involved in a retrograde process, but a much easier part of it because he's no longer backwards. And you've got both Mars and Venus, the other two personal planets, in their home signs. And when those planets are in the place where they are most comfortable, we are more comfortable. We make decisions in a more organic way when the decision-making planet is in his home turf of Aries, and we are more connected to our feeling bodies when the planet that relates to our emotional body, Venus, is at home in Taurus. So just to give you a little recap of the whole kit and caboodle of Mercury's cycle. The first section was April 25th through May 10th. That was the triggering of material that might have come up in between May 10th and June 3rd when Mercury was in the backwards motion. And then on June 3rd, he turns around, covers everything for a third and final time between this weekend and June 18th. Have at it, kids. with five Mondays in it because I get to talk to people and introduce my audience to folks out there who are, well, two things. They both have to be doing interesting work in the world, or why would I talk about them? (laughs) And I have to have some loving history with them. So I am introducing you guys today to an old dear one of mine, Brian Mahan. Brian Mahan is a somatic experiencing practitioner. He's going to talk a lot about what that is when we get uh, diving into this. But if you've done any classes with me, anybody out there listening who's taken any of my classes know that I talk a lot about the body and trauma. We talk a lot about how body is held in the trauma and therefore healing is in the body. And there's been so much new stuff that has been discovered around physiology and and trauma in the body over the last like bunch of decades. We have entered some beautiful new territory about healing both physical traumas and emotional traumas through this notion of embodied stuff where the body captures, holds everything, and therefore there's the healing. So without any further ado, I want to introduce you all to Brian Mahan, my good friend, and this beautiful work that you're doing in the world that you've just come out with a brand new book that is sort of introducing what you do to everybody. So why don't we start with that, Brian? What's a somatic experience practitioner? Well, um, first of all, Michael, so good to see your face, even though (laughs) we're on podcasts, it's been forever. At any rate, somatic experiencing is a naturalistic approach to working with trauma. And basically, we understand that trauma is a physiological condition, not a psychological disorder. And the reason why we look at it as a physiological condition is that because we can become traumatized, preverbal, precognitive, and preconceptual. Yeah, so right. before we can think and reason, we can become traumatized. <laughs> so obviously, there's a different system at play. And that's the lower brain, which is our like early detection warning system and our guardian angel all wrapped up in one, how it governs the autonomic nervous system. You know, so the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system, the how we mm. react and respond to threat, whether threat is perceived or real. We have very real reactions to it. Yes, very, very much so. 
Now, you you have always known a lot about the body and energy, and I, I'm going to tell you something that I don't think I've ever told you before. Okay, so 25 million years ago, or probably more <laughs> like 25 to 30-something years ago, you and I met. And at that time, you were a body worker. You were a massage therapist. Correct. And I saw you the first time because you were referred to me by somebody. And I went to your studio. I had a beautiful experience of your deep and abiding gifts with moving energy in the body. But I saw you the second time because something happened to me the first time I was on your table. And I literally went back the second time to see if it would happen again. At the very end of the massage, Brian, you put your one hand sort of down by my root chakra, uh, one by my head and my crown. You put a finger on my perineum and one on the very tip of my head at the top of my crown. I was like 25 years old. Much of this stuff was new to me, right? But man, oh man, when you did that, my body spun. And I mean spun out in an energetic way that was very satisfying, marginally mysterious to me because this was a new experience. Not my first time at that particular rodeo, but it was the first time that I felt a sense of what I would call like a binary, a switch on off, like you switched on something about the movement of energy through my body. And so I came back to you again about, I don't know, a month or two or three later to see if that would happen again. And it did. So I'm curious about like before you, before the accident, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that changed your entire life and your perspective. And before Mm -hmm. you dove into this world, you already had, from my estimation, an organic pre-installed sense of body and the energy. Can you talk to us a little bit about your sense of that before your deep education? Sure. I guess it all really kind of started in an organic and weird way. When I was in theater school, part of the you know um, warm-up exercises and after experience yeah. exercises, we'd get into massage chains, right? So everybody, you know, like a daisy oh, chain of everybody massaging each other's shoulders. Yeah. And everybody always wanted to be in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and so at one point when I was living in New York City, you know, I was waiting tables. I, you know, probably had gotten fired again because I got fired from just about every restaurant <laughs> that was stupid enough to hire me. You know, so I realized that, you know, that was something that I always did. And so I just kind of like, put it out there that I was offering hands-on work. And I just always had this sense of energy being drawn in through my left hand, moving through me and out through my right hand. Hmm. And after a while, I began to have the experience of kind of taking people's pain on. But I took it on in my body on the opposite (laughs) side of where they had it. That is, of course, the challenge of being in an empathic, open, energetic system and being gifted at that, but being unconscious of what can happen with the energy exchange when you yourself are carrying around some embodied trauma. (laughs) Yeah, I had a wee bit of trauma myself. Wee bit. (laughs) So you did that body work, that turned into a a bit of a full-time, like, profession for you. Yes, I started doing it without any kind of training in New York, and I developed a really strong practice very quickly, very high-end type A's, and then I was also working on the Merce Cunningham and Martha Graham dancers. Ooh. So when I relocated to Los Angeles, I started waiting tables again, and of course, still didn't like it. And so I decided... (laughs) Did you think that was going to be miraculously different? No, yeah. (laughs) So I decided to uh, train in massage, but I wanted to work in a way in which Mm. that I wasn't doing what I had done before because I was taking on people's pain. Although I seemed to process it quicker, I was working on so many people and Merce Cunningham and Martha Graham dancers and so I yeah. was just racked with pain all the time. Yeah. And I would wake up in the middle of the night and my <laughs> hands were stuck in claws, you know, and I couldn't like straighten yeah. my fingers out. And I'd have shooting yeah. pains up my arms. And 
all that kind of yeah. thing. And so I checked around and I found um, a school and I talked to the one of the teachers there and he told me, you need to work on boundaries. You're an empath, but you need to yeah. work on boundaries. And so that was the beginning of me kind of transforming the capacity to do what I do without it taking a toll on me. And yeah. now I've parlayed that boundary work into you know teaching workshops and trainings on boundaries. But um, you know, and then even in the in the trauma training, the somatic experiencing training I went through, um, we worked a lot with, or we worked to a degree with with boundaries. And now, because of my capacity to hold my boundaries, I'm able to sit with six, eight, ten people a day working yeah. on the worst events and traumatic experiences That's of their right. lives. And I feel better at the end of the day, the more clients I have. It's beautiful because it's, it's natural and organic for us as, as beings to energetically connect, exchange energy and impact each other. But when we do that through drama, the impact is traumatic as opposed to freeing. Absolutely. Our nervous systems resonate with one another. You know, the expression, I, I walked into the room and the energy was so thick I could cut it with a knife. But what that yeah. means is, is that all those people had gotten together and they had entered into a common energetic resonant field. Mm -hmm. So they might have mm -hmm. been, you know, watching the Super Bowl and they're all amped up in that way. Or they may have been listening to amazing music and amped up in that way. Or there may have been, you know, they, they've uh, come together to mourn the loss of someone and their energy is in that place. And when your nervous system walks into that collective energetic resonant field of all those nervous systems it's palpable yeah you can feel that right i walked into the room and the energy was so thick i could cut it with a knife mm. now your journey changed fairly dramatically because of a circumstance indeed it was an accident pretty bad one in fact, my understanding is. So can you take us there to tell us, first of all, this, you know, for the gruesome details, to tell, <laughs> tell us the story of the juicy accident. Let's start with that. Well, it was four nights before Christmas um, on the 10th freeway, uh, 2000. Oh, gosh. I, I always forget the year. It's wow. been so long. At any rate, 17 or 18 years ago, I, or 2003, I was uh, driving to see a client. And uh, imagine traffic in Los Angeles, cr Christmas rush hour, last yeah. minute gift shopping. Yeah, right, right, right. Basically what happened is I was hit by one of two cars that were racing on the freeway. The first car blew by me. The second car clipped me, which sent my car end over end. Then it rolled three times across three lanes of traffic, lit on the driver's door 150 feet and crashed into a concrete wall. <laughs> she, she, should, she should be so dead. She should be like gone three times over. Oh, and insane. I had some really extraordinary experiences in the middle of that car wreck, uh, which I detail mm. uh, in my book. Yep, beautifully detailed in the book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the title of the chapter is The Best Thing That Ever Happened to Me. So there was, you know, there was all kinds of extraordinary things that happened in those few seconds that it takes a car to flip and over and roll a few times and crash into a concrete wall. But, you know, time had slowed down and it was really quite an extraordinary lucid experience for me. Yeah. And I walked away relatively unscathed physically, right? I mean, I had some red rash on my shoulder, my elbow, and some whiplash. But then sometime later, and again, I'm not really sure about the timeline of that because I was in such a dissociative state for my entire life leading up to the car wreck <laughs> and then, you know, after the car wreck taken into a completely different realm you know i started having panic attacks and i didn't know there were panic attacks i thought i was either going crazy or had become possessed and i didn't even attribute it to the car wreck because i had you know walked away from the car wreck Right, you had you had assessed the physical damage was not so bad, and right. so what you were experiencing might not have been related to that at all. And in some ways, it was, and in some ways, it wasn't. Well, you know, I think that you're right. Yeah, but I think that ultimately, and you know, in trauma talk, we call that a high intensity global activation. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> so it basically unlocked and unleashed. Everything yeah. that I'd been compartmentalizing, suppressing, That's holding right. in, That's everything right. that I'd try to, you know, 
put in a box and shove into the corner recesses of my mind or wherever it is we compartmentalize things. So, you know, that event just buried me with everything I thought I had been healing for 25 years that all came back in spades. What is astonishing to me about the story and the lucidity of that moment and the real threshold of before and after that this accident was and the work of being of service to humanity that followed, you know, in the way that I view the world as, you know, through the lens of consciousness and unfolding, that this peak numinous experience was a soul called forth experience. That because your soul called it forth, the lucidity in the car for my money is about the fact that you came to do this work. And this moment that you were confronted by the physicality of the accident, your soul demanded that you be 100% lucid about the whole thing. Because even if it took a little while for you to get what it was you were needed to be up to next, your soul certainly had every awareness that this was the key moment of like line in the sand before and after. Now everything changes. Absolutely. My soul got me to that <laughs> longitude latitude on the great planet Earth at that nanosecond. And it was just for me. No other car was involved. It was just for me. I love that. I love that. I love that. So take us sort of in the, the briefest sort of version of the story from the panic and the aftermath of that and how it led you to discovering somatic uh, experiencing. Okay, so after several days of flapping around on the floor like a fish on a hot rock and howling at the moon with the curtains drawn and the lights <laughs> off, and, <laughs> you know, I had come to the logical conclusion that I was possessed. But somewhere in that... <laughs> but literally, Brian? I mean, literally, literally. Like, literally, your thoughts was, I think something has entered me? I thought that okay. during that place between the here and the hereafter, that something evil had glommed on to me because it's the okay. only thing that could explain what was happening in my body and in my brain and all of that. So I eventually was able to peel myself off the floor. I made my way across town to my first point in health, who was named with Dr. Connie. And I asked her for the referral for an exorcist. <laughs> Did she have one? <laughs> no. Okay. I'm just so glad I didn't go to a priest. Now, that would have been the best story, though, Brian. I'm so sorry that the story isn't, yes, and then I went to see them, and here's that story. I mean, sweetie. <laughs> so exorcism wasn't the solution. No, so she said, oh, honey, I don't think you need an exorcist. I think you need a trauma specialist. And yeah. so she sent me to a somatic experiencing practitioner, and in three sessions, my panic attack stopped. Wow. And within two weeks of that training, there happened to be a training in Santa Monica. And so I started the training two weeks later. Okay. So in the limited amount of time that we have to connect today, it's not like we're going to be able to unpack all of this in a 20, 25 minute interview. That piece right there. I mean, and of course the book, by the way, the book is called, I cried all the way to happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> which is maybe one of the best titles of a book ever. <laughs> you talk about this, of course, in great detail, but c can you give the listening audience a, a sense of how that's even possible that a few interventions could have generated such a deep unconscious shift to free you from panic attacks that were rising up from your unconscious? How's that even possible? Well, um, because the somatic, you know, working somatically, we change the focus on the lens. And so yeah. the attention goes to the body. The narrative is only used as a catalyst to bring the system online. And so once the, there's activation in the nervous system, whether that's emotional or some sort of micro movement or gross behavior, we drop the story and we focus on the sensations. Mm. And so... You know, there was a really interesting study done at the University of Chicago by Dr. Eugene Jenlin, and he was trying to figure out why some patients were getting better in a therapeutic practice and others weren't. And after 20 years of looking at every different type of therapy and the therapists themselves, he determined that the single most determining factor as to whether or not anyone 
gets better in any practice with any practitioner is based in the client's ability to feel sensations in their bodies, to language those sensations appropriately, and then to attach the right affect or emotion to that collection of sensations, and then the right meaning or belief <laughs> about the emotion. I just need to repeat something for the listening audience in case this slipped you right by. This study crossed over multiple disciplines and multiple interventions. The salient factor here was a person's awareness of their body. Right. And that was the beginning of the body-mind connection in the therapeutic practice. And Dr. Eugene Genlin went on to have the Lifetime Achievement Award created for him in the American Society of Psychology. Oh, gosh, I'm forgetting the actual <laughs> organization they gave it from. You know, he wrote a couple of great books, uh, Focusing and The Felt Sense. Um, and it was, it was a game changer, absolute game changer. And so, you know, my job is to get my clients to quit seeing me as quickly as possible. Right. And so that's where I begin. Love that. I have to first help a client, if they're not already there, get to the place where they can feel what they're feeling, then be able to break it down into the sentient expression, language it appropriately, tolerate it effectively, and then explore the affect and meaning from yeah. there. But most people start with concept or, or meaning before they're, you know, is this what you were sort of talking about? One of the points you made in the book that really got me was that you said often you meet people and they're gung-ho, they're ready to go mm -hmm. and, and move fast, but that there's often an adjustment needed to get them to learn a couple of skills. And, and yeah. this would be that body sensation and absolutely. linking sensation with some awareness. It's absolutely foundational. If that's the, the single most you know, qualifying Thing that moves someone towards healing, then that has got to be the foundation. That alone is worth the read of the book, kids. So we're kind of coming close to our wrap up here, but I do need you to tell us why this book is called brilliantly. I cried all the way to happy hour. Tell us what's the ideology of that title. So I had a client come in on her second session I asked her, what did she remember about her first session and how, if at all, had it played out over time? And she looked at me and leaned forward and squinted her eyes at me. And she said, I'm not a crier. <laughs> I don't cry. And when I left here last week, I had to meet a colleague for cocktails and I cried all the way to happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, not sorry. Yes, all of that. And then I lost brilliant, my mind and brilliant. she was offended. And then I repeated it back to her and she started laughing and I started laughing. And, and I looked at her and I said, can I have that? <laughs> That's the title of my book. That's the title of your book. So Brian, who is this book for? Oh, such a great question. This is for trauma survivors, especially those who do not know that they're trauma survivors. This mm. is for people who struggle with shame, especially those who do not realize that they struggle with shame. This is for people who struggle with habituations, patterns, habits, and vicious cycles, and no matter what they've tried, they can't seem to shift them. Mm, that's right. They can't seem to shift it. So the book is written so that my high school-educated 85-year-old mother can understand it. It's entertaining. <laughs> One of the greatest things I've heard from people is that it makes them laugh out loud. And yeah, to have it's, a it's book cute. written about trauma that makes you laugh out loud, I think that's a great thing. Yeah. But the whole idea is this is a primer. If this could be yep. the first book that somebody reads That's on right. their healing journey, my God, it That's would right. save them so much time and money. Oh, my God. I, 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 yes, I would want everybody who comes to take one of my deep dive classes, my shadow class, the Finding Your Voice class, or the ones where I use myth and fairy tale, and know this, read this, oh to gosh. understand the power of the irrational and the power of the body to hold and express, and that that's where... I, that's that's the barometer, not from the neck up. Indeed. It's really in the body. Well, so here's that awful last question that people who interview people like you ask. What's the one thing <laughs> you want everybody to know about, you know, deepening their healing through somatic awareness? Nothing changes until your beliefs do. 
Mm. And you can't change your beliefs through mental gymnastics. It doesn't work. In order for your beliefs to change, we have to work on the wounds where they were formed. We have wounding experiences and we form beliefs about ourselves, the world, other people, the location, the situation, the behavior, whatever what was going on, we form all kinds of beliefs in those experiences. And those beliefs run the show. And so in order to change beliefs, we have to work on the original wounds and we have to have reparative and corrective experiences in the present day. When there's enough of those two things happening, there's a watershed moment where the beliefs lose their veracity and they fall away. And at that point, you'll have better skills, tools, knowledge, and resources and life experiences to where new beliefs can be formed based on who you are and where you are now. Beautiful. Brian Mahan, Somatic Experiencing Practitioner. The book is called I Cried All the Way to Happy Hour. It's available at Amazon. And then where can people find you if they want to look into the possibility of working with you? My website is briandmahan.com. And all of my social media is at Brian D. Mahan, S-E-P. Beautiful. Thank you, Brian. This was great, great fun to connect and share your stuff with my audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time, ever since I saw you branding yourself as conscious embodiment, because I've known you for a million years. <laughs> I know, years. baby. <laughs> It's a twinsy moment. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaellennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.